I have three kids, 24-year-old male, 18-year-old female, and 14-year-old female. My late husband died very unexpectedly four years ago due to infection 19. He didn't have a will, but we had a life insurance policy that provided a $360,000 death benefit. As his spouse, I received the full amount. I decided to divide the money four ways. I would get $120,000, and each of my three kids would get $80,000. At the time, my daughters were both minors, so I told them they could access their full amount when they turned 18. However, if they ever wanted to do something pricey, I would allow them to use some of their share. Most of their needs were taken care of by me. My son was over 18, so I gave him his share right away. This arrangement was a verbal agreement, and I intended to follow through with it fully. Recently, however, my middle daughter, we will call her Maya, was arrested in December for child endangerment because she severely neglected her little sister, leading to something awful happening under her care. She had to use some of her $80,000 to pay for lawyer and court fees, which left her with about $65,000. Fast forward to today, and my youngest daughter is still struggling significantly. During her checkups, she scores very low on mental health evaluations and is on a high dosage of antidepressants. She often jokes that if she were to tell us or the doctors how she truly feels, she would be put in a psych ward. Maya no longer lives with us, as I felt her presence was doing more harm than good to her sister. She's staying with my parents for now, but has been begging me to give her the money I promised after she graduated. I've been hesitant to do so. My sister, who is familiar with the situation, believes Maya doesn't deserve the money and that I should use it to stay home longer with my youngest, who will be alone during the day once I return to work soon. With my youngest's declining mental health and school being out, I'm very worried about her. Maya is about to go off to college, and I know most of the money would go toward that. However, I'm still very angry with Maya for the pain she caused her sister. I'm having a hard time making this decision. So would I be the jerk if I kept her inheritance? I'm interested to hear everyone's perspective just be kind. To add, I didn't expect so many comments, but I'm reading through all of them. To the ones that are asking what would my husband say if he was here, I honestly don't know. That's why I'm conflicted. A part of me wants to think he would honestly say for me to give Maya the money so she can go to college, because college was important to him. But also, another part of me knows that if he heard the details about what happened to Leah, he would be way more brutal than I am and disown her permanently. So it's hard to make a call on what he would want when I don't know. Now for a tiny update. I saw a couple comments that told me I should ask Leah. I didn't flat out ask her as if it was her call, to avoid putting unnecessary pressure on her about what I should do. But she told me, Mom, I think you should give it to her because I don't want her to be mad at me. She already blames me for getting kicked out. She still loves and cares about Maya. She doesn't blame her for what happened to her yet. The reason why I say yet is because I haven't sat down with her and helped her fully understand what Maya did to her was wrong, and I'm honestly dreading it. She doesn't know what Maya has said about her, or doesn't know the true details of why she was arrested. In her head, she thinks Maya was arrested because she threw a party. Now for a few comments before the update. Comment one, not the idiot, no more money to Maya, ever. That $65,000 can go to Leah for therapy. Get whatever documents you need in order, like a will and lists of beneficiaries, and cut her off forever. What she did with the party is awful enough, but her attitude is evil and unforgivable. I'd also talk with your parents to be sure they don't fund her. If that jeopardizes her college, too bad, so sad. And it's not her money anyway, it's yours. And since she has shown you who she truly is, tell her you've changed your mind and she won't get a dime. Comment two, based on your other posts, Maya doesn't deserve a dime. She ruined her sister's life. Keep the money and take care of your younger daughter. She's going to need your help. Maybe then Maya will actually be sorry for what happened to her sister by her friends. Not the idiot, not even close. Now, for the update. Hey everyone, thanks for reading. So a lot has happened in the past week. I finally decided to sit down with Leah and have that difficult conversation about what really happened with Maya. I was dreading it, but I knew it was necessary. I explained to her, in the gentlest way possible, that Maya's neglect was more serious than just throwing a party. Leah was quiet for a long time after I told her. She didn't cry or get angry. She just sat there, 
processing everything. I could see the wheels turning in her head, and it broke my heart to see her struggling with this new information. Meanwhile, Maya has been calling me almost every day, asking about the money. She's been accepted into a good college, and she needs to start making payments soon. I can hear the desperation in her voice, and it tears me apart. I want to help her, but every time I think about what happened to Leah, I get so angry. My sister keeps reminding me that Maya doesn't deserve the money, but it's not that simple. I feel like I'm being torn in two different directions. One evening, I got a call from my parents. They told me that Maya had been acting out, staying out late and not following their rules. They were worried about her and suggested that maybe she should come back home. I was shocked. I thought Maya was doing okay with them, but it turns out she's been struggling too. My parents think that being away from home and the family is making things worse for her. They believe that if she comes back, we might be able to work through our issues together. But I don't know if Leah is ready for that. And honestly, neither am I. Then, something unexpected happened. I found an old letter from my husband while cleaning out some boxes in the attic. It was a letter he wrote to me when we first found out we were going to have our first child. In it, he talked about how important family was to him and how he wanted us to always support each other, no matter what. Reading that letter brought tears to my eyes and made me think about what he would want me to do in this situation. It didn't give me a clear answer, but it reminded me of the values we shared. I decided to talk to Leah again, this time about the possibility of Maya coming back home. I asked her how she would feel about it, and to my surprise, she said she missed her sister. She told me that despite everything, she still loved Maya and wanted to give her another chance. This was a huge relief for me, but it also made my decision about the money even more complicated. I called Maya and told her that we needed to have a serious talk. She came over the next day, and we sat down in the living room. I told her about the letter I found and how it made me think about our family and what we stand for. I explained that I was willing to give her the money for college, but there were conditions. She needed to come back home, follow the rules, and work on rebuilding her relationship with Leah. Maya was quiet for a moment, and then she started crying. She apologized for everything and promised to do whatever it takes to make things right. The next few days were tense. Maya moved back in, and there were a lot of awkward moments. Leah was trying her best to be supportive, but I could see that she was still struggling with her feelings. I decided to take some time off work to be there for both of them. We started having family meetings every evening, where we would talk about our day and how we were feeling. It wasn't easy, but slowly we started to see some progress. One night, during one of our meetings, Maya opened up about why she had been acting out. She admitted that she felt guilty about what happened to Leah and didn't know how to deal with it. She said that being away from home made her feel even more isolated and lost. Hearing her say that made me realize how much pain she was in too. It wasn't just Leah who was suffering. Maya was hurting as well. I decided to reach out to a family therapist to help us navigate through this difficult time. We had our first session a few days ago, and it was eye-opening. The therapist helped us understand that healing would take time and that we needed to be patient with each other. She also suggested that we set some boundaries and create a plan for moving forward. As part of the plan, we agreed that Maya would start seeing a counselor on her own to work through her guilt and other issues. Leah also agreed to continue her therapy sessions, and I promised to be more present and supportive for both of them. We also decided to set up a family fund from the remaining inheritance money to cover any future therapy or medical expenses for Leah. This way, we could ensure that her needs were taken care of while still supporting Maya's education. In the midst of all this, I found out something that added another layer to the situation. My sister confided in me that she had been struggling with her own mental health issues and felt overwhelmed by everything that was happening. She admitted that her harsh stance on Maya was partly due to her own struggles and not just about protecting Leah. This revelation made me realize that we all had our own battles to fight and it wasn't fair to place all the blame on Maya. So here we are, trying to rebuild our family one step at a time. It's not easy and there are still a lot of challenges ahead. But for the first time in a long time, I feel like we're moving in the right direction. Thank you for reading. Am I the idiot for accusing my wife of having another affair in front of the school moms? My 31-year-old man have been married to my wife, Jessica, 
26-year-old woman, for five years. We have a four-year-old son. When our son was two years old, Jessica had an emotional affair with her boss. That was the first and last time that I ever yelled at her. I completely lost my cool, and with our son at his grandmother and grandfather's house, I yelled myself hoarse at her. I had never been so hurt. Over the last two years, things have gotten a lot better between us, although I still can't deal with the thought of intimacy. And I'll be honest here when I say that I'm still hurt on a deep level. Last year, we put our son into kindergarten. My wife and I alternate between picking him up. One of the biggest benefits of this is that my wife has made a lot of new friends and become part of the mom group there, which I think is great. But early on, I noticed her mom friends giving me the side eye. Some would outright glare at me when they thought I wasn't looking. Well, on Tuesday, my wife forgot that it was my turn to pick up our son, and we both ended up parking in front of the kindergarten. She had arrived first and was already inside. I went in to greet her and surprise our son, who I thought would be psyched about having both mommy and daddy pick him up. I found her talking to the moms and quickly told her that it was my turn to pick him up. The other moms gave me the same look as they usually did, but I didn't really care. About 10 minutes later, my wife was still talking to them and our son was getting restless. I asked her if I should just take him home or if she wanted to go too. He wanted to watch his mother's car from ours. She impatiently said, okay, okay, just don't yell at me again. At first I was confused, but when I saw the look on the other mom's faces, it hit me that the reason those mothers seemed apprehensive around me and were never friendly was probably because my wife had planted that seed early. She routinely brings up my so-called verbal abuse at home, so it made sense that she would bring it up to her friends to badmouth me. I stared in shocked silence for a few seconds and then responded, what? Did you have another affair with your boss? Everyone looked shocked that I'd say something like that, so I shrugged and told my son we were going. My wife got home a few hours later, walked in the door, went to the bedroom, and locked the door. The next day, she yelled at me, ironically, and said it was my job to pick him up. Now, normally, I'd not be asking this here, but yesterday, one of the mothers pulled me aside and said it was a dollar crappy thing I did to my wife. Was I out of line here? Now for a few comments before the update, comment one. Dude, she is putting out her side of the story making you look like the aggressor. When in reality, her affair put you in an emotional position where your anger got the better of you. She chose to lie to her friends and say you are an awful person. Get a dang divorce. You don't need trash in your life. Comment two. Not the idiot your own wife is literally talking shoot about you to strangers. You don't need to apologize for anything. She should be kissing your butt all the time since you forgave her for being a cheater. But I guess even when she's wrong, you're wrong. Now, for the update. Thanks for all the comments from my last post. After that incident at the kindergarten, things have been tense at home. Jessica and I barely spoke for the first couple of days. She was clearly upset, and I was still reeling from the realization that she might have been painting me as some kind of monster to her friends. I tried to focus on our son and keep things as normal as possible for him, but it was hard to ignore the tension. On Thursday, Jessica finally broke the silence. She sat me down after our son went to bed and told me that she felt humiliated by what I said in front of the other moms. She said that she had never intended to make me look bad and that she was just venting to her friends about our arguments. I told her that it felt like more than just venting and that it seemed like she was trying to turn people against me. She denied it, but I could see the guilt in her eyes. We went back and forth for a while and it became clear that we were both still carrying a lot of hurt from her emotional affair. I told her that I still struggled with trusting her and that her comments about me yelling only made things worse. She admitted that she hadn't fully understood how much her affair had affected me and that she was sorry for bringing it up in front of others. It was a small step towards reconciliation, but it didn't solve everything. The next day, I decided to take a half day off work to clear my head. I went for a long walk and ended up at a coffee shop where I ran into one of the moms from the kindergarten. She was surprised to see me and asked if we could talk. Reluctantly, I agreed. She told me that Jessica had confided in her about the affair and that she had been trying to support her through it. She said that she didn't realize how much it had affected me and that she was sorry for judging me without knowing the full story. This conversation made me realize that maybe Jessica's friends weren't entirely to blame. They were just trying to be there for her, and they didn't know my side of the story. 
It also made me think about how isolated I had felt during the whole ordeal. I didn't have anyone to talk to about my feelings, and it had taken a toll on me. When I got home, I decided to have another talk with Jessica. I told her about my conversation with the mom and how it made me realize that we both needed support. I suggested that we try couples therapy again, something we had tried briefly after the affair but had given up on. Jessica was hesitant at first, but she eventually agreed. We had our first therapy session on Monday. It was awkward and uncomfortable, but it felt like a step in the right direction. The therapist helped us see that we were both holding on to a lot of resentment and that we needed to find a way to communicate better. She gave us some exercises to do at home, like writing letters to each other about our feelings and reading them out loud. As the week went on, we started to open up more. Jessica wrote me a letter about how she felt during the affair and how she regretted it every day. I wrote her a letter about how much it had hurt me and how I was still struggling to move past it. Reading these letters to each other was painful, but it also brought us closer together. In the midst of all this, our son started to notice that something was different. He asked why mommy and daddy were talking more and why we seemed sad sometimes. It broke my heart to see him so worried, and it made me realize that we needed to be more mindful of how our issues were affecting him. We decided to make a conscious effort to keep our arguments and serious discussions away from him and to focus on creating happy memories as a family. By the end of the week, things were starting to feel a little more hopeful. Jessica and I were still a long way from being fully healed, but we were making progress. We had another therapy session scheduled for the following week, and we were both committed to working on our relationship. Looking back, I realized that a lot of our problems stemmed from a lack of communication and understanding. We had both been so focused on our own pain that we hadn't taken the time to really listen to each other. The therapy sessions were helping us see things from each other's perspective and find ways to rebuild the trust that had been broken. One night, after our son had gone to bed, Jessica and I sat on the couch and talked about our future. We both admitted that we were scared of what might happen, but we also agreed that we wanted to try and make things work. We talked about our dreams and goals, and it felt like we were reconnecting on a deeper level. As we continued to work on our relationship, I couldn't help but think about the past and how it had shaped us. I remembered the early days of our marriage when everything seemed perfect and how quickly things had changed after our son was born. I thought about the emotional affair and how it had shattered my trust in Jessica, but I also thought about the good times we had shared and the love we still had for each other. I knew that the road ahead wouldn't be easy, but I was willing to put in the effort to make things right. Jessica seemed to feel the same way, and for the first time in a long time, I felt a glimmer of hope. Thanks for reading. For Am I the idiot for filing for divorce after my husband's affair with our mutual friend, I, 21-year-old female, and my husband, 20-year-old male, have been together for a little over three years and have been living with each other for a year and a half. Recently, I found out about an affair he has been having with one of our mutual friends. Let's call the mutual friend Sue. Sue had been friends with him since a few months into our relationship. She would always join us to hang out and play games together and so on. Sue and I became friends quickly. But this is where things take a turn. She started to pull back from wanting to hang out with me, or even both of us together. Sue would claim that she just wanted to hang out with the boys, even though that only included my husband, and how she didn't want to be involved with other girls as it gave her anxiety. Although being bitter about the situation, I understood and gave her the time to hang out with my husband and space away from me. I found out about the affair while my husband was in the shower and left his phone unlocked and in the room with me. She had called him, so I picked up. Without letting me get a word in, she started going off about how he was going to call her when he was in the shower to have sexy time and how she couldn't wait for him to come over to her house tonight. I hung up immediately. I couldn't believe he would do that and thought it was a prank call and left it at that. Until later that night, he had randomly left the house with his computer open. I know I shouldn't have, but I went through their messages as his computer gets his text messages as well. This affair had been going on for about a year, and it's to the point that they are sending lovey quotes back and forth to one another and telling each other they love one another every day. He would also sleep call with her because she was in a bad state of mind very consistently.
At first, I passed it off as him being a good friend, but it eventually made me uncomfortable. He has also been telling her that one day he will convince me to become polyamorous so she can come live with us and we will all be together. I am not polyamorous and have made it very clear to him since the start of the relationship that polyamory was a boundary for me and would never be considered. He has never mentioned anything about him being polyamorous as well during all this time. After I found out about the affair, I didn't mention anything to him for a while, but mentioned to him how I feel uncomfortable with her presence because it was obvious she had feelings for him, as well as saying I would like them to stop sleeping on call with each other, hoping that he would come to the conclusion himself and leave her. But that didn't happen. It was eating me apart inside, so I finally confronted him about it. He told me he was just being selfish and how he loved both of us. I told him that I had made it clear before we got married that I would never be open to an open relationship or polyamory due to past relationships. He got upset, asking how I found out, and that I shouldn't be snooping through his stuff. I left the house after that and got a hotel room so I wouldn't be around him while he was so angry. He texted me the next day asking if we could talk about it all and where we go in the future. After a long talk of why he cheated and what all happened, he told me that he didn't want to lose me and that he would unalive himself if he lost me over his mistake. That's when I told him I would not continue to come around or be in his life if he doesn't kick her out of his life. I told him I would be open to fixing things but would not be able to trust him again with her still in his life. He again got very angry and said I couldn't do this to him and I was ruining his chances of being happy. Am I the jerk? Now for a few comments before the update, comment one. He's so upset about the thought of losing you, he's going to unalive himself, but won't do the bare minimum to keep you? I'm calling nonsense. He said it himself. He's selfish. Run, girl, run. Comment two. He already chose her. You choose yourself. You don't need to be with someone whom you'll never be able to trust again. That's just asking for a lifetime of stress and paranoia. Now, for the update. Thanks for all the comments from my last post. So here's what happened next. After our intense conversation, I decided to stay at my friend's place for a few days to clear my head. I needed space to think about everything. During this time, my husband kept texting and calling, begging me to come back and promising he would cut Sue out of his life. He even sent me screenshots of messages where he told Sue it was over between them. But something felt off. His sudden change of heart seemed too convenient, almost like he was just saying what he thought I wanted to hear. A few days later, I went back home to talk things through in person. When I got there, he was a mess. He looked like he hadn't slept or eaten properly. He apologized again and said he was willing to do anything to make things right. I told him that if he was serious about fixing our relationship, he needed to show it through actions, not just words. He agreed and said he would go to therapy to work on his issues and prove his commitment to me. For the next week, things were tense but somewhat hopeful. He started going to therapy and even asked me to join him for a couple's session. I agreed, thinking it might help us communicate better. During the session, he opened up about his insecurities and how he felt neglected because I was always busy with work and other responsibilities. I admitted that I had been preoccupied, but reminded him that cheating was not the solution. The therapist suggested we both work on our communication and spend more quality time together. Just when I thought we were making progress, I found out he was still in contact with Sue. I saw a message pop up on his phone while he was in the shower, and it was from her. She was asking if he was okay and saying she missed him. My heart sank. I confronted him immediately, and he tried to downplay it saying she was just checking in on him as a friend. But I wasn't buying it. I told him that if he couldn't cut her out completely, then we were done for good. That night, he packed a bag and left. He said he needed time to think and figure out what he really wanted. I was devastated, but also relieved. It felt like a weight had been lifted off my shoulders. I spent the next few days focusing on myself, trying to process everything that had happened. I talked to my friends and family, who were all supportive and encouraged me to prioritize my own well-being. A week later, he came back and said he had made a decision. He told me he wanted to be with me and was willing to cut Sue out of his life completely. He showed me a message he sent her, telling her it was over and that he needed to focus on his marriage. He even blocked her number and deleted her from his social media. 
I was skeptical, but decided to give him one last chance. We started working on rebuilding our relationship. We went on dates, spent more time together, and continued therapy. Things seemed to be getting better, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was still off. I started noticing little things, like him being overly protective of his phone and getting defensive when I asked about his day. My gut was telling me that he wasn't being completely honest. One night, I decided to check his phone again while he was asleep. I know it was wrong, but I needed to know the truth. I found a hidden messaging app where he had been talking to Sue the whole time. They were planning to meet up and continue their affair behind my back. I felt sick to my stomach. I woke him up and confronted him, and he finally admitted that he never stopped seeing her. He said he was torn between us and didn't know how to let go of either relationship. That was the breaking point for me. I told him I was done and that I wanted a divorce. He begged and pleaded, but I had made up my mind. I packed my things and left that night. I moved in with a friend temporarily while I figured out my next steps. I filed for divorce the next day and started looking for a new place to live. The fallout from all of this has been tough. I've had to explain the situation to my family and friends, who have been supportive but also shocked. I've had to deal with the emotional toll of ending a three-year relationship and the betrayal of someone I thought was a friend. It's been pretty hard on us of emotions, but I know I made the right decision for myself. Looking back, I realized there were red flags from the beginning that I ignored. My husband had always been a bit possessive and insecure, but I thought it was just because he loved me so much. I never imagined he would cheat on me, let alone with someone who was supposed to be my friend. It's been a painful lesson, but I've learned to trust my instincts and prioritize my own happiness. As for Sue, I haven't heard from her since the confrontation. I blocked her on all social media and deleted her number. I don't need that kind of negativity in my life. I'm focusing on healing and moving forward. I've started therapy on my own to work through my feelings and rebuild my self-esteem. It's going to be a long journey, but I'm determined to come out stronger on the other side. Thanks for reading. If you like this video, you'll probably like these too. Also, while you're here, please consider subscribing. It's your support that keeps this channel alive and allows me to make better and longer videos. Have a great day!